Uh, now we continue uh, the program with our third panel of the day. Uh, this one is about Nordic conservatism. And leading the panel is Eivind Evenstar. Uh, he was introduced previously, but I'll as well go ahead and introduce him again. So he is a philosopher and the previous uh, president of Fax Oslo. Please give him a warm welcome. Now, uh, welcome to the uh, panel on uh, Nordic conservatism. Uh, I understand there will be some restructuring here, uh, since uh, two of our speakers will be using uh, PowerPoint presentations, um, and so I'm afraid um, the speakers will not be able to, to sit down uh, until after the presentations, and we will bring the chairs back. That is my understanding. Um, but I am, uh, I am, uh, my name is Eivind Evenstahl, as you, as you heard. Uh, I am lucky enough uh, to be joined today by three uh, great uh, thinkers and writers from uh, three of the uh, Nordic countries. Um, all of their resumes are very impressive, but also quite extensive, so I will keep it short and um, you will hear a, a, a short presentation uh, from each of them uh, in the order that, uh, I, uh, that I read their names. Uh, Hannes uh, Gisrarsson uh, is uh, from Iceland. He is a professor of politics at the University uh, uh, of Iceland um, and author of several books, uh, including uh, 24 Conservative Liberal Thinkers, uh, a book from 2020. Uh, you'll have to stop me if I, if I uh, uh, make a mistake in your uh, in introductions. But um, next we have Jakob Söderbaum. Uh, he's from Sweden. Uh, he is a Master of Law, a member of the advisory board of the Roger Struten Legacy Foundation, and uh, author of books like Modern Conservatism, uh, also from 2020. Uh, and, and you may have seen some of his books on the table uh, outside. And lastly, um, Kasper Stövring uh, is from Denmark. He has a PhD in Literary and Cultural Studies, if my understanding is correct. Lecturer and also author of several books about conservatism from a Danish perspective. Um, so uh, I will... Um, I will um, invite uh, Professor Gisrasson to uh, to give the first uh, short. I'm sorry. Yes, Professor Gisrasson to, to 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 have the short, uh, the first short presentation, um, uh, one of three before we sit down uh, and discuss the topic of Nordic conservatism. So, <laughs> Professor. Uh, dear uh, students and my fellow speakers, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, I have to address you in English even if I speak in Norwegian like Danish and Swedish, being from Iceland and uh, of course there is a close relationship between Iceland and Norway, Björnstein and Björnsson, he said, Iceland er et uh, svemmet uh, av Norge, or uh, Iceland is... Uh, you know, uh, a part of Norway that has swam away. And uh, the Norwegians and the Icelanders, they uh, are sometimes competing about who it was that discovered America. We thought that we discovered it. And Oscar Wilde, he actually agreed. He said the Icelanders discovered America, but they had the good sense to lose it again. <laughs> because our settlements uh, there, uh, they didn't su succeed. And of course it is unfair on the Americans, a uh, wonderful uh, new world, as it is. But uh, it is true that uh, <clears throat> my book, uh, uh, 24 Conservative uh, Liberal Thinkers, uh, uh, was published in 2020, and it's available online for your charts. And uh, it was also printed and has been distributed in many New Direction uh, seminars. And I know that... Uh, my fellow speakers, they, uh, when they refer to conservatism, they refer to some of the same uh, thinkers that I discuss, like Edmund Burke and Michael Oakeshott. 
uh, and, uh, uh, and, and some, some others. The first chapter actually in my book is about a figure familiar to uh, Norwegians, Snorri Sturluson, because if you uh, really uh, read uh, closely uh, Snorri Sturluson, you find four ideas which are crucial and uh, pioneering for uh, what I define as conservative liberalism. One of them is that kings are subject to the same law as their subjects. The second one is that there is an informal social contract. If the kings violate the law, they can be deposed. And actually, in Heimskringla, that I'm sure most of you have read, or at least parts of it, uh, Snorri Sturluson uh, gives a, an account of what a good king is and what a bad king is. The good king is somebody who uh, imposes very light taxes and keeps the peace. A bad king is somebody that imposes high taxes and is a warrior. Uh, that reminds me actually what a good friend of mine uh, Sir Anthony Fisher, who started many of the think tanks around the world, used to say in his toast, he didn't say skål, as we do in Iceland, or skål, as we do in Nor Norway. He said for peace and low taxes. And I think that's actually a, a very uh, prudent uh, uh, wish. Then uh, in uh, Eil Saga, the Saga of Eil, uh, Snorri Sturluson celebrated individuality. Eil Skattergrinsson, a warrior and a poet, he stands alone against both the gods that have uh, brought two of his sons to death and uh, to the Norwegian kings. There was a feud between Eil's family and the royal family of, of Norway. It's sometimes said that uh, Rome and Juliet are the first uh, individuals, but they are not. Eil Skattergrinsson is in, uh, when individuality emerged uh, in the Renaissance period and, and before that. Then Actually, Snorri, even if he thinks that perhaps kings may be appropriate for other countries, if they're good kings, he uh, has a wonderful speech that he puts into the mouth of an Icelandic farmer, that kings are different, some are good, others are bad, and therefore it might be, might be best to have no king. And that's what the Icelanders had for uh, three centuries during the Commonwealth. As Adam from Bremen said, Aput illus non est rex, nisi tantum lex. And as you know very well, this means they have no king but the law. And then, uh, <coughs> because I'm here to, to illustrate that the uh, traditional liberty is a Nordic tradition, despite uh, all the prejudices abroad about the Nordic countries. Uh, Anders Denius, who was a Fenno uh, Swede, 11 years before Adam Smith, he uh, provided not only a coaching critique of mercantilism, but also uh, arguments for sp free speech and for mutual gain. And uh, it's really a marvelous idea that uh, we can all win, that there is a, a possibility of positive some gains. I benefit and you benefit by us serving each other. So the profit of one needn't be the loss of others, which is really the greatest left-wing fantasy. And then another marvelous idea, intriguing idea is that we can have coordination without commands, that we can have a, an order that will uh, develop spontaneously without coercion. We can have social harmony. And this is very clearly uh, presented in Ante Sydney's book uh, uh, on the national gain. Then we have actually, and I discovered this uh, rather recently, that uh, uh, you, of course, in Norway are proud of having uh, the most liberal constitution in Europe at the time, which is still in force, mostly. And uh, a lot of influence on it uh, was made by the Anker family. And the Anker brothers, they actually were friends, personal friends of Adam Smith. They visited Adam Smith, both in Glasgow and in France. And uh, they uh, provided for the first uh, official translation of the Wealth of Nations into Danish. So uh, there, is a, uh, there is a strong link between the Itzwal um, uh, Constitutional Assembly, which was actually held in the house of one of the two Anker brothers, and Adam Smith, both a personal and a political one. Uh, <coughs> we had, uh, in the 19th century, a strong liberal tradition in all the uh, Nordic countries. Uh, uh, here is Johann August uh, Griebenstedt, uh, who was Prime Minister of Sweden and implemented a lot of liberal reforms. 
We had Schweikort in, uh, in Norway and other liberal Nordic politicians, and they were influenced uh, by Adam Smith and Frederick Bastiat mainly. And uh, even a Grundtvig uh, was perhaps more of a radical liberal than a conservative liberal. Uh, I think that we can quote his words uh, to effect today as then, Freehead for Loke, so well, so for Thor. That is to say, freedom is not only the freedom of those that agree with us. Freedom is also freedom of those who disagree with us. Or as Rosa Luxemburg said, Freiheit is immer the Freiheit des Andersdenkenden. Uh, freedom is always the freedom to disagree, to, be, uh, to, to dissent. And uh, I think personally that uh, the reason why Denmark and Sweden became a relatively liberal countries is that they lost their empires and they began to trade instead of to conquer. And this is uh, very well expressed in the words of the two poets that I'm quoting there, Holst, but Uda Tabes skal inad vinnes, what we lose eternally, we will reconquer or uh, regain or recover uh, internally. And Tegner, uh, as a Tegner, the well-known Swedish poet, he said, in on Sveriges grens er over af Finland otter. That is to say, to conquer again inside Sweden uh, the Finland that we lost by, uh, you know, building up a flourishing society. I think this thought was very important in the Nordic countries. Then, uh, finally, I come to uh, uh, what I find to be very interesting uh, thinkers in the uh, Nordic countries in the 20th century. Um, we have Gustav Kassel, who had a special ability to express his uh, thoughts uh, clearly. We had uh, Elie Heckscher, who was as uh, profound uh, and renowned uh, advocate of economic freedom and um, conservative uh, liberal. And we had Bertil Olin, who perhaps leaned a little bit uh, to the left, but not uh, so that it became harmful. He was, of course, the leader of the uh, Folkpartiet in uh, Sweden for a long time. And in Norway, we had Tryggve Hoff, who was uh, a conservative liberal, as his book from 1945 uh, shows very well. So I think that the Nordic countries, uh, they are not really what the socialists say they are, examples of successful social democracy. Uh, they have a strong uh, conservative liberal tradition, and, uh, uh, is, uh, which is also embodied in institutions. The reason why they are successful is that they have the rule of law, including uh, protection of private property rights, they have free trade, and they have a great social cohesion. Uh, the accumulation of cultural capital over centuries uh, upon which they have been able to, to draw. So I just conclude by saying, Norden er Jorden. Thank you very much. Now uh, I will invite Mr. Soderbaum uh, to give your uh, presentation. Watch, the, uh, watch out for the water glasses and uh, give a hand to... <laughs> So, yeah, I just couldn't uh, refrain from using this photograph of an uh, older incarnation of myself together with Professor Roger Scruton. This is, uh, I think, in Madrid uh, some 15 years ago. So, uh, I have been asked to tell a little about uh, the history of Swedish conservatism and also a little bit what it is today. And uh, the question also was, is this connected to Rodi Scruton somehow? And, and definitely yes, I say. So if I push this button, all right. So what I start with, what is conservatism today? Uh, if you read uh, Swedish um, professors of politics and idea historians, um, everyone says that Edmund Burke is the father, the founding father of not only of conservatism as a movement, but, but the father of the ideas of conservatism. The Swedish word is Laro, father. Uh, and it is also uh, widely maintained, although not by all, that Friedrich Hegel, Georg William Friedrich Hegel, the German philosopher, uh, is also one of the fathers of uh, conservatism. And uh, this is, of course, uh, very interesting from a Scrutonian point of view, 
because uh, Roddy Scruton built his conservative philosophy as a synthesis of Burke and Hegel, as does Michael Oakeshott. And uh, Scruton does this in the line of Oakeshott. Um, so uh, it's also a part of uh, the way Swedes understand conservatism today, that conservatism is um, divided between the social conservatives, more welfare, the social um, po kind of politics, uh, and the liberal uh, conservatism, more uh, about civil society and more about economical liberalism. Very, very uh, broadly described here now. But, um, and the, today we also have three uh, parliamentary parties which um, uh, gravitate around the idea of being a conservative party. I wouldn't say they are truly conservative, but so it's the moderate party have once again understood, started to, trying to understand themselves as conservatives. Uh, the Christian Democrats have fin finally realized that they are conservatives, and uh, the Sweden Democrats really, really want to be conservatives. Um, and I, I figured, how could I do this presentation? I, I will go through a lot of historical uh, moments uh, from a Swedish point of view and with a lot of years. And I decided just to start uh, and showing the years to have for you to have something to, ha to hook it up on uh, because you know a lot of other things that happened during those years. Um, so this is, uh, I will walk you through the, the history of conservative in Sweden in this way. So, 1789, the French Revolution. And in, of course, 1790, Edmund Burke publishes his work, Reflections of the Revolution in France. In Sweden, at this time, we have the King Gustav III. He is actually performing a coup d'etat, uh, which is of conservative, uh, with a conservative agenda against the, the liberals of the time. Um, he reads Edmund Burke. He gives Edmund Burke a Swedish state pension. Uh, he also tries to uh, organize and orchestrate uh, internationally uh, a counter-revolutionary movement. He is not successful, the movement is not successful, but he's there and he's actually trying to do something about uh, the problems with the revolution uh, and the Napoleonic War spreading it. And here we are, uh, well, in the middle of the Napoleonic Wars. This is an important time in Swedish history. This is when our, the last war we fought uh, started, uh, which meant that we lost half of Sweden, the eastern part, now Finland, um, and um, we became a union with Norway. Um, we also had the, uh, one of the generals of Napoleon became a Swedish king, and uh, the first thing he did was to start a war with Napoleon. Uh, this is important to mention because you will see some other uh, conservative uh, things going on here because of this. Um, so what happens here is that Sweden um, is starting really to lose its um, uh, personal self-understanding as a European superpower. This starts in 1809, but it doesn't end, of course, until we, uh, the, the union between Sweden and, Nor and Norway is, is lost 100 years later, almost. Um, but we, we, what Sweden needs at this point is to, to, to re redefine its own um, mindset, own understanding, a, no, a new notion of nationality in Sweden. Uh, so this is what uh, Swedish conservatism is, is for about 100 years concerned with. We have um, the, the, uh, the constitution of uh, 1809, which is um, made by uh, the Swedish statesman, no, not statesman, but anyway, his name is uh, Hans Hjerta. Uh, he writes the constitution, uh, and he, he is influenced by Edmund Burke. Uh, around this time, we also have uh, the philosopher Christopher Jakob Boström, who is a Hegelian the theologist. Uh, he is considered as Sweden's uh, foremost philosopher through times. No one today has heard of him except for intellectual, uh, intellectuals in Sweden, but he's there and he's actually uh, doing some kind of theological 
Hegelian uh, synthesis as a philosophy. Um, and moving forward to, um, yeah, so in the mid 18th, before the, uh, before the late, uh, we have the Goetheism or Gothicism, um, which is on the, the European continent, is uh, founded by uh, François René de Chateaubriand, who is also the one who invents the term conservative. Uh, this is a very strong movement in Sweden, and uh, we have a, a very important, pol you could say, political active, um, political activist uh, poets, as Esaias Tegner mentioned by Professor Gisrason, and Erik Gustav Geier. Erik Gustav Geier is also very, he's most known uh, for turning away from conservatism into liberalism. However, he is. Uh, taking inspiration from Burke and Hegel. Uh, we also, in this era, uh, the mid-19th century, uh, have a very strong free church Protestant movement. Uh, I think you should see this um, as a, a Swedish counter-enlightenment uh, uh, movement, which is very interesting. Uh, this is also connected to, there are, there are uh, researchers today showing that Sweden didn't really have a true enlightenment movement. So this can be understood in, in, in this um, contrast. Uh, so the second half of the 19th century, of course, industrialism takes uh, its course. And it's uh, a lot of German uh, industrial men and capitalists who, who, who uh, runs it. During this time, we have uh, the, the, the king. We had two kings named Oscar. Uh, the, the last uh, king of both Sweden and Norway was uh, Oscar II, and uh, he is also the last crowned king of Sweden. And uh, the the kind of um, bourgeoisie movement, uh, Oscarianism, uh, uh, it's 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 a very strong. Uh, conservative bourgeoisie movement, and uh, still when I started to, to study in Uppsala in around the year 2000, uh, you still refer to those times, and you think of old uh, conservative people, they are Oscarians, you know, toasting in, in, in punch and such things for the king. Um, and it's also worth mentioning here, because we also have uh, members of... Uh, the student association Heimdall here, it was founded in 1891 in, in Uppsala and it's still active today and it has meant a lot of, it has been important to the course of conservatism in Sweden. So uh, we are now entering uh, the early 20th century and uh, the union with Norway breaks. Uh, Sweden is uh, uh, only a nation state. Uh, and this is where a huge debate, intellectual debate, between two camps of conservatism take place in Sweden, between Harald Järne and Rudolf Schelen, uh, first and foremost. There are others in, in this debate. It, it's a truly tremendous uh, intellectual debate. And Harald Järne is basing his philosophy on, on Burke, Disraeli and Bismarck, and Rudolf Schelen Broadly, uh, he, he has a lot of references to Burke, but he's first and foremost uh, a national conservative with, uh, I would say, quite authoritarian views, uh, also pro-welfare. Uh, in 1910, uh, this is when uh, Heimdall, the student organization, proclaims they are uh, uh, for reform-friendly conservatism, which they still now, 110 years later, uh, say, claim they are and also are. Interestingly enough, this is at the time when Lord Hugh Cecil's book, uh, Conservatism, is published, first in English in 1911. This is the first book ever to mention Edmund Burke as the, fa the father of the ideas of conservatism. It's translated to Swedish the year after, in 1912. 1930s. There are a lot of things to be said here, uh, but from, from the point of view I want to make, uh, the perspective here, uh, I think the most important is that the liberal uh, state, how do you say, pro 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 professor of politics, uh, Herbert Tingsten, he writes a book in Swedish called De, De Conservativa Ideana, The Conservative Ideas. 
And, and this is the no dominating uh, reference book on conservatism for many decades to come. And it's uh, really showing conservatism from a bad side. Um, Sweden did not take part uh, of uh, the, any of the world wars. Um, and even though um, this, uh, we, are, we arrive in the 1950s in a situation when it's very controversial co to call yourself conservative because basically it seems that uh, the right is uh, uh, responsible for everything that happened in the world wars and, uh, and the conservatism is, is synonymous with uh, the right. So this is where uh, conservatism is starting really to lose its grip in Swedish social, uh, social debate. 1968, it's uh, also in Sweden we have a student revolution. Uh, Gunnar Heckscher, who is the son of Elie Heckscher, who was also mentioned by Professor Gisurarsson, uh, he has been the, the leader of the moderate party for many years. He, he leaves in 1965. And this is also when the aforementioned Harald Jane, his ideological um, heritage in, in the, the right party, uh, uh, ceases. Uh, in 1969, the right party changes its name to the moderate party and they start to call themselves liberal conservatives. We also have the Christian Democratic Coalition. Uh, they, they are founded in 1964. After, after a referendum uh, on whether we should keep, uh, how to say, Christianity in, in uh, elementary school education, uh, to two and 2.1 million Swedes, which is 30% of the population, say yes, we want to keep it, and, and the Social Democrats overrule. Uh, and this is when the party is built, and they think they will now be a great parliamentary party, but it takes another 30 years in, in, until they, in the 1990s, enter the parliament. During this period now, we are in the end of the 1960s, uh, Gunnar Heckscher, as mentioned, uh, and also Nils Elvander, they write the history of Swedish conservatism during the 19th century, and they relate it to other conservative movements in Europe. This is where the distinction of liberal conservatism and social conservatism enters the Swedish social debate. Russell Kirk, the American conservative thinker, is mentioned the first time uh, in a book in 1968 um, called De politiska idéernas historia. 1970. This is the year, 1976, when uh, the first center-right government for 44 years uh, comes into government. Um, and um, in 1974, before that, the old constitution of 1809 has been exchanged for a one, the 1974 constitution. Um, in 1971, uh, there had been two books very important uh, published. One is Ny Konservatism in USA, the new conservatism in the USA. <coughs> Uh, which um, also, uh, it, 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 uh, it discusses Russell Kirk in, in philosophical terms, among other things, and also Champan the Conservatism, uh, Fighting Conservatism, um, which, uh, among other things, uh, introduces the distinction between value conservatism and structural conservatism. This is a German concept which is uh, immediately taking over to, to the Swedish debate from this. Uh, year, uh, and uh, this is also when the first Swedish conservative think tank, Conservativt Idea Forum, is founded, and it's, uh, it's around for about 10 years. This is also when, uh, I think it's worth mentioning, uh, the professor of politics, Reda Larsson, his Politiska Ideologier i vår tid, uh, it's, uh, he writes about all the different ideologies, uh, it's from the 1970s, and his chapter on conservatism is, uh, of all Swedish conservatives I met, they, everyone thinks this is absolutely best. So that is where I started my, uh, the way I understood conservative, conservatism. 1983. This is w the year when the moderate party's youth organization throws out all conservatives from the youth organization. Uh, the moderates turn into neoliberals, uh, and the socialist uh, journalist 
Gunnar Fredriksson writes conservativa idéer, a book uh, which is not very positive. Uh, it's interesting if you understand conservatism in other ways, but this is already 1983 where, the, where he interviews Roger Scruton. Uh, 1990s. Uh, this is where we had the second uh, centre-right government uh, since the start of democracy in the 1920s. Carl Bildt uh, is the Prime Minister of the Moderate Party. This is also the year uh, when Conservativa Sällskapet, the Conservative Association, is founded with many, uh, or by many uh, old Heimdall um, chairmen. Uh, and they also um, unite moderates and Christian Democrats, and this is important. Um, they also uh, do some lectures and write some uh, relevant essays on Russell Kirk um, in their uh, uh, magazine called Contextus, which is published between 1997 and 1999. This is the year when I uh, entered uh, politics in the Moderate Party's youth organization, but this is not important at least not at this point. Um, uh, around this time, uh, there is a, a new book on conservatism published by a conservative, uh, Fredrik Hage, and his book, Nycklar till modern konservatism, Keys to modern conservatism. It's very short, it's a pamphlet, it's uh, very uh, vague and uh, not very much going into any relevant details, I would say, but still, it's a conservative saying something about what conservatism is about. Uh, this is in a situation when uh, there is no party uh, who, who believes in conservatism. And uh, at this point, there is a network called Engelbrecht, uh, and there is a magazine called Salt. They have huge scandals. They are being scandalized for uh, um, yeah, right-wing extremist views, which are not true, but this is how things work in Sweden at this point. Conservatism around the turn of the millennium is an underground movement. No one wants to have anything to do with it in the moderate party or the Christian Democratic Party for the, near, the next year, 10 years to come, even though there are strong networks. Uh, this is, um, let's see, around the, this time in 2002, uh, I'm one of the founders of Conservative Forum, who tries to, to organize and, and make uh, a forum uh, for people uh, from the Moderate Party and from Heimdall and from the Christian Democratic Party, uh, mostly young people from all across Sweden, to, to meet and to understand that it's not you who, who is an idiot among the, the, all the very more much uh, smarter liberals. Uh, other conservatives are here. So this kind of the Nostos conference here, this would be, have been absolutely undreamable uh, only 15 years ago in Sweden. Um, uh, we also have um, a, a magazine called Access, which uh, uh, writes uh, some about Roddy Scruton and Michael Oakeshott. 2010, uh, from some, some people uh, who are more or less good writers from Conservative Forum, they, they start the uh, um, digital magazine, or the blog basically, uh, called Tradition of Fason. Uh, like tradition and good character, uh, and tried the, publishing a thousand articles on conservatism in three years, trying to create legitimacy for uh, this underground movement. Um, this is also uh, when Conservativa Förbundet, the conservative association, is founded, still exists today. And at this point, uh, we have a book called Handbook i Konservatism by uh, the PhD in politics, Stefan Olsson, the first one to actually go into ideas, but it's quite light, so to speak. We're closing in on today, and as I said, we now have three parties, the moderates, the Christian Democrats, and the Sweden Democrats, who are positively interested in conservatism. Things have changed. Uh, the Conservativa Förbundet gather a thousand members uh, Oikos is a uh, think tank uh, close to the Sweden Democrats, which is founded. Uh, the liberal uh, pro-market think tank Timbro starts a liberal conservative program. 
Um, my book, Modern Conservatism, uh, is also published, uh, focusing on Burke, Hegel, Oakeshott, Kirk, and Scruton, on the ideas, not on the, idea, the history of ideas I now talk about here. Uh, and there's also uh, uh, an, antho an, an anthology called Samtida Röster om Konservatism, uh, present day voices on conservatism with uh, writers from Heimdall and also an, an, an anthology called I Konservatismernas Tid in the time of the different conservatisms published by the Access uh, Foundation. Uh, a lot of things are starting to happen uh, in Sweden right now about conservatism and I would say that uh, Rodius Scruton's thinking is in the center of it, although not very much uh, discussed this way. There is much to hope for on uh, September 11. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Um, I will ask uh, Dr. Kasper uh, Stovring to uh, give uh, a few short remarks uh, that you have prepared. Um, uh, try to keep it short. I know. Uh, uh, just, just sit there for now, and uh, and we will get uh, our chairs up after. Uh, we're running short on time, but I want to give time to everyone. So, um, <clears throat> how much time do we have left? Because um, ten minutes or fifteen. If we only have ten minutes, then I will skip my. Presentation. We can uh, just talk. Uh, we have uh, we ha we have more than that. Uh, we we can go a bit over. But okay, uh, I'll do it shortly then. A short one. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I will not talk about uh, Nordic conservatism in the sense that I will talk about uh, specific specific thinkers or the history of uh, thinking. I would instead point to some specific traits of the Nordic countries that I consider uh, conservative some contemporary traits uh, that I consider conservative and where I'm, I think that conservatives really should uh, act. And uh, that is uh, the issue of uh, social cohesion. Because uh, a lot of well-documented knowledge exists about the Nordic nations, we know that there is a widespread solidarity and positive national emotions are strong. We know that the nations are culturally homogeneous and that there are very high levels of trust, prosperity and uh, civic liberty and that the states are characterized by a low level of uh, corruption. So in sociology, the attempt to achieve such a high level of cohesion is sometimes expressed as the problem of getting to Denmark. That's at least how Francis Fukuyama phrases it. However, Cohesion cannot be and has not been the result of mere political and legal institution building. It's also a matter of culture. In other words, there are specific cultural prerequisites for social cohesion, and these can be found in nations such as the Nordic nations. So the informal cultural norms that promote cohesion include virtues such as honesty, reliability and, in general, reciprocity, that is, the willingness to help each other. In short, so social cohesion is constantly created spontaneously when people live their ordinary lives in civil society. Civil society is the key word here. This kind of trust cuts across social divisions and, historically, it's due to the many civil movements which have existed in the Nordic nations since the 19th century. These movements have held, has helped uh, to create a cooperative social capital. In particular, the cooperative movements and sports movements in the 19th and 20th centuries where people came together in, uh, so to speak, bottom-up and voluntarily organized work around enterprise and building of sports centers, these movements have played a major role in terms of creating social uh, cohesion. At least in Denmark, this uh, civic engagement has also been expressed in a well-organized community building upon peasant and worker movements, as well as the free church and free school movements. 
So society is, and this is the conservative idea, society is in danger of being undermined and atomized if it lacks what sociologists term mediating structures in civil society. Mediating structures such as cooperative movements, but also, of course, strong neighborhoods, families, voluntary associations, and uh, churches. So it's clear that social cohesion relies on belonging to a common culture, whereas multiculturalism tends to weaken cohesion. Cohesion seems to thrive best in places of cultural homogeneity and national solidarity, such as in the Nordic nations. In short, one could argue that in a free civil society there must be internal moral bonds between citizens, for only then can they accept that there are limits to their freedom, that the right of one person is the duty of uh, another. So lastly, the crucial aspect of the historic breakthrough of Protestantism in the West was that virtues such as honesty and re reciprocity were widely practiced outside the narrow group such as uh, the family. So, shortly to summarize, communities with a common core culture and a common moral language of good and evil are simply more integrated in the sense that they have stronger social cohesion than culturally diverse societies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now, we will join again on the, on the stage. In our chairs for a short discussion. Um, I don't know if there's any specific order. Uh, I think sit, sit in any order you wish. <clears throat> All right. So, so we've heard um, many interesting uh, ideas. Uh, from different perspectives. Um, as, uh, uh, as has been touched on, uh, we, we often speak of uh, uh, conservatism in the Nordic countries as being uh, inspired uh, and, and influenced by thinkers um, from other countries, uh, Anglo-American thinkers like Burke and Kirk, uh, Germans like Hegel and so forth. Um, but we have also heard that, um, that the 13th century uh, Snorri Sturluson can be seen as a conservative thinker, and, um, and Dr. Stovring talked about the need for uh, belonging to um, one's own culture. So, um, uh, is there anything uh, I want to ask all of you, and... and, and um, uh, first one to answer, um, is there anything specifically Nordic about Nordic conservatism? Um, is there a shared historic culture uh, among the Nordic uh, uh, countries that we, uh, or that conservatives should aim to preserve? And how can that be done? Um, so. so, well, I think uh, there is such a thing as uh, Nordic uh, conservative liberalism as I uh, would like to uh, define it. And it isn't only rooted in the, in the ideas and arguments of uh, foreign thinkers, but also in, embodied in the institutions that have developed over the centuries in the Nordic countries. And uh, my uh, Danish colleague here, he explained very well the social cohesion and the spontaneity uh, of... Uh, of uh, intermediate institutions, uh, uh, civil society, which, is, uh, which characterizes the, um, the, the Nordic countries. But I, I just wanted to add, if I may, uh, one or two comments about the uh, thinkers uh, mentioned here, Berg and Hegel and uh, Oakshot. Mm -hmm. I think that Berg, actually, as Adam Smith said, he was the only man who thought as, uh, uh, in the same way about economics as Adam Smith did himself. Edmund Berg was uh, an economic liberal, very much so. 
for example, in his thoughts on scarcity uh, and so on. But what, what he did and what made him a conservative liberal was his opposition to the French Revolution. And uh, there was a great difference between the English Revolution and the American Revolution that Burke uh, su supported and the French Revolution. The, uh, the uh, English and the American revolutions, they were made in order to preserve existing liberties and extend them. Whereas the French Revolution at least developed into an attempt to reconstruct society according to abstract principles, and Burke rightly, and so did uh, Alice de Tocqueville and Benjamin Constant, uh, saw that this would, not be, uh, this would lead to disaster. As it did, it was a bloodbath. The French Revolution cost uh, the lives of 40,000 people. Now, Hegel can actually be interpreted in a liberal way, as a, as a liberal uh, thinker. And I have sometimes played with uh, trying to define what I would call the conservative liberal uh, political tradition as the self-consciousness of Western civilization. It is the Weltgeist when the Weltgeist ha real has realized who he or she is. Uh, and Oakeshott, of course, uh, celebrates individuality in his uh, works. Uh, so I believe that he, he can be called a conservative liberal. What he basically says that in the process of uh, Western history, the individuals have acquired the will and the ability to make choices, so that the task will be to, uh, to develop uh, abstract rules that, that enable them to make those choices and implement them. So all of them would belong to this tradition that I'm talking about. Yes, and um, um, as uh, has been uh, mentioned also by, um, uh, by Jakob, uh, um, there is this um, distinction that is often made between different types of conservatism and it can be difficult to draw a clear line between conservatism and liberalism. Um, I don't know if we should move on to talking about that because I, think, I feel like there might be some... Uh, Disagreement or at least nuance in views uh, on that topic, or does or uh, do, do any of you wish to comment on specifically Nordic culture before we move on to that? I, I have one remark uh, yes, which please. I'm thinking of, and it's uh, it's about um, no, it's actually two two folded. Uh, one is that we are part of the European North, uh, where also I would say uh, Burke and Hegel are part of, of the same kind of uh, intellectual context, which is a clear difference between, uh, from the Mediterranean uh, states and the Catholic uh, societies, uh, which uh, I think makes it uh, easier for us in, in Scandinavia to agree with a lot of the thought coming from, from, from England and, and from Germany and such thinkers. Um, uh, and also, I think it's a, a, an important thing that we share in common and that there is something we should look uh, upon with uh, other eyes than the left do. It's, it's the welfare state and how it has developed. Now, of course, the, at least the Swedish, I suppose that Norwegian is also too large, uh, trying to get into too much and become a more of a almost totalitarian kind of uh, system steering uh, everything from above in, in the society. And this is not at all conservative. But uh, we can see that uh, Disraeli and uh, Bismarck, uh, they also have the basic ideas of the welfare state, uh, which they pioneer. And uh, in this way, I think that uh, when now also those thinkers are starting to get interesting in the United States, we have a heritage of, of this kind of thinking in Scandinavia, uh, and that's where I think that uh, we have a lot of to, to add from our views, uh, and it is getting more and more uh, interesting also on an international level. Um, uh, I, yes, uh, I, I don't think that very many people actually read uh, probably the two most important conservative philosophers, namely Edmund Burke and uh, Alexis de Tocqueville. At least I haven't uh, stumbled across people who, who read them, at least before 1980, 70 or so. But the core ideas of these two conservative thinkers uh, have been um, expressed in society, and I'm thinking, of course, uh, the, the, the concept of the small platoons. Nordic countries are rich in, sm in small platoons. And that's, 
what I call social cohesion or intermediate structures in, in civil society. Uh, and I was also thinking, Hannes, when you talked about Snoy Stolusson, that this high level of trust we have in Nordic countries is, is, is a generalized trust. It's trust among strangers and it's trust to institutions. And I think that might go several years back because you talked about this idea that even the king was subject to the same law. So that might be a kind of trust building experience that has sustained throughout generations. Now, uh, there is one important thing that we haven't touched upon, and that is we have very large welfare states in the Nordic countries. And I think that's a huge problem for conservative thinking, because what the welfare states does is to destroy social capital in civil society. And most notably, this has been seen in uh, regards to the family. Now, we pay so much in, in tax that people can't afford to stay at home and, and, and rear their children at home, so we send them to kindergarten and all kinds of institutions. When you get divorced, you get a lot of money from the state, so it can actually, economically, it's, it's a good idea to get uh, divorced. It doesn't sustain the, the family. And uh, even uh, in Denmark, I don't know how it is in Sweden and, and the other countries, in Denmark, the state pays for what we call solo mothers, so they can be pregnant and so start a family without fathers. That's, that, that, that's, uh, I think that's really destructive for the kind of conservative intermediate structures in, in civil society, especially the family. Do I have time for one? Uh, yes, do you want to comment on? on yes, definitely. I think uh, you're absolutely right. That, uh, and that's the reason why I think uh, conservatives and classical liberals should join together that the state is destroying the values that we hold dear. Uh, it is dissolving the family and uh, attacking private property rights and uh, threatening continuity and stability with uh, cons uh, conservative values. Just one more thing about the Nordic um, heritage. I think actually, uh, which is a Germanic uh, heritage as well, I think uh, you're absolutely right in what you said about the, that, but also, uh, I, the self-government of the German tribes that Tacitus describes in Germania uh, and uh, the, uh, the contrast that Otto von Gierke uh, made between uh, Genossenschaft and uh, Herrschaft, uh, that, that was to say uh, social relationships and uh, top-down uh, relationships, I think they are quite relevant. And this is something that I am doing research uh, on now since I am publishing an anthology of conservative liberal thought in the Nordic countries. Mm. I'm just wondering uh, then uh, if you do not see it as uh, meaningful to draw uh, any distinction between conservatism and liberalism, uh, if we are uh, in it together, uh, so to speak. Or, uh, I think, uh, you know, to uh, reply in the short uh, sense, it was socialism that brought uh, conservatives and liberals together. Mm -hmm. But uh, the tradition that I have been trying to identify in my book is a tradition that combines conservative insights and classical liberal principles into one coherent whole. And the main uh, question that is uh, asked by people like Hayek is, why is it that we have accomplished so much, given our individual ignorance, which is recognized by um, uh, conservatives, because one, uh, one basic idea of conservatives is, of course, uh, individual humility, how little we know. So how, uh, how is it that they can accomplish so much if we know so little, each of us? Uh, Hayek answers, in the present, by prices that uh, uh, transmit knowledge, and uh, between generations by tradition. So uh, 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 the pricing mechanism, the free trade, and the respect for tradition, it is those two things that enable us to, uh, to, to uh, enjoy uh, a civilization and knowledge which we do not possess ourselves. And I think this, no, this uh, civilization is really a, a miracle, the Western civilization that uh, enables us to get together here and discuss ideas. Um, if I just a sh uh, short comment, I think there is a huge difference between liberalism and conservatism. And one of the, the, the books that I've enjoyed the most in the recent years is uh, the American philosopher um, uh, Patrick Deneen's book, uh, Why Liberalism Failed, in which he argues that paradoxically the welfare state or the state has grown uh, alongside with 
an emancipation project. Because when you set liberals free, you have, you have to have a larger state in order to, to uh, realize all these rights that the individual uh, has. And, and that's the story of, uh, of Denise's book, I, I think, uh, is very, uh, is very uh, convincing. So liberalism and socialism, in, in a strange way, are, are bedfellows in, in, in this sense. Because, of course, the reason, of course, is that individuals who live in civil society, there are, have been placed limits on their actions. And, and most people, not most people, but some, many, a lot of people want to liberate themselves from these moral norms that places limits on them, and therefore you have the, the state that intervenes directly in civil society. So if you haven't read uh, this book, I will surely recommend it. Mm. I totally agree with also this view, and uh, I think it's important in, in, in our time. Of course, there are a, a lot of different ideologies that call themselves liberal, uh, and also that call themselves socialist, and, and some that don't call themselves that and still are of the same kind of philosophical heritage. And, and with Hayek, I would also say that he suggests that uh, politics uh, are three-dimensional rather than center, no, rather than left and right. Uh, it's, it's conservative, liberal, and socialist, uh, where, where there are all three different poles uh, that all oppose each other. Uh, and um, uh, in this way, trying to focus on, on the differences, uh, I think, is uh, quite good for us to do in, 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 the, in the era we are now living in, because, uh, as we have heard in, in several other lectures today here, uh, there are a lot of things about our civilization which uh, we all agree, it seems, that we need to preserve. And the idea, the notion of uh, th what is best, uh, I think, is, is very well put because conservatives want both to pr preserve what is best, and we can disagree about that, but we, we are looking for the best in different ways, in, in uh, or trying to keep in contact with some kind of canon. The best is the civilization part, and we also like to keep our cultures. Uh, it's important to be Norwegian, or to be a Swedish, or to be a Finnish. And also within our countries, we have traditions. Uh, and conservatives like those kind of differences, uh, and we like to travel uh, nomadic travels, uh, some of us at least. Uh, I uh, like to, to experience this kind of different cultures where it uh, exists. But I think that we are now in, in an era where we need to formulate how we can preserve all this. Uh, and, and really, I think Rodri Scruton does this very, very well. Yes, uh, this is all very interesting. Clearly, some, some difference of opinion. I wish we could uh, just keep going, uh, discussing this for the rest of the day. Uh, uh, do I have time to ask uh, uh, each of you one more question? I'm wondering who will give me permission? Just one final question for them to answer. So, what is one thing that Nordic conservatives can learn from the thought of Sir Roger Scruton, including the things we've heard about today? Right, try to keep it short. Just well, I uh, I happen to have known Roger Scruton, and uh, I think he, uh, you know, and I had very interesting discussions with him. In fact, when I did my doctoral dissertation at Oxford in 1985, I criticized Scruton uh, because I thought he was unfair on classical liberalism. But what happened in the time from 1985 and, uh, to 2019 was really that he moved much further towards uh, Hayek's idea. He, he more or less accepted the knowledge argument. The dispersal of knowledge requires the dispersal of power. So um, this is what I think uh, we can learn from him, but uh, the speakers that were spoken earlier today are absolutely right that uh, uh, economic growth is not the only goal in uh, life. In fact, it is a, a secondary goal. I think the Aristotelian idea of the flourishing of individuality is really the uh, great goal, but the precondition of that is a free society. Thank you. And Jakob? Yeah, I, I would just put it like this, that uh, Scruton has this synthesis of Burke and Hegel, uh, and, and I would say that uh, it's, it's, it, it, there is so much uh, in, in this lovely intellectual well uh, that I think is interesting for, for Nord Nordic, from a Nordic conservative perspective, because it has to do with our civil societies, our, the, the cultural heritage which we share between the Nordic countries. Uh, so, uh, 
ac accepting Hegel as a, a great fun uh, philosophical fundament for Burke's uh, arguments. That's, that's uh, what I think is the heritage of Scruton for, for the Nordic countries. Good. And lastly? Well, uh, Scruton uh, asks us uh, to preserve the things we love. Um, and uh, one of those things are national cultures. Uh, there are many crazy movements in, uh, in our time and uh, also in, in the Nordic uh, countries who wishes to aggressively abandon nationality. I think Sweden is even a, officially a multicultural country. <laughs> so uh, we must uh, roll, roll back these uh, movements and tendencies and, and conserve nations uh, because nations are the things that bind us, uh, us together and creates uh, cultures of trust. Thank you. And uh, give a big hand to, uh, to our panel. Uh, thank you very much.